We've had another action-packed week here in Starbase, and a windy one. We had a next-generation Starship getting tested, and preparations for Starship Flight 6 still continue. Oh, and we flew this week, which allowed us to see the huge amount of progress SpaceX has made on the second launch pad here in Starbase. Howdy, Tank Watchers. I'm Jack Byer for NSF, and this is your Wind Base Update, sponsored by Brilliant. Let's start off with that next generation Starship that I just mentioned in the intro. That's Ship 33. If you watched our last Starbase update episode, you already know that Ship 33 had rolled from the Mega Bay 2, where it was built, all the way down to the Massey Outpost ahead of its cryogenic proof testing campaign. Well, that's exactly what happened this week. Although it seemed like at first there was an aborted, or at least just a partial test, Ship 33 appears to have successfully completed its cryoproof testing with three different tests taking place this past week. We really don't know if that first attempt was an aborted cryo, or maybe it was something else like a pneumatic test where they only load gaseous nitrogen, or perhaps it was just a partial load. In either case, whether they just did a pneumatic test or something else, it would make sense even if it was aborted because this is a brand new generation of ship. This new version is only about a ring taller, but has an increased tank capacity with stretched tanks and a shortened payload bay section, and surely a myriad of other internal changes we can't see. We could see very well though, how much bigger this tanked section is thanks to this round of cryo testing. Since we're able to see all the frost on the outside of the tanks, we can compare that to previous generations of ships. I know some of you may be concerned by the new shortened payload bay section, but remember, this is just version 2 of Starship, and SpaceX already has said that there'll be an even longer version. If you remember, from all the way back in April, SpaceX gave us this handy slide from Elon's presentation, outlining the numbers for the two upcoming versions of Starship. We already suspected, based on those numbers, that version 2 of the ship was going to have to give up some of its payload base space to fit the extra 300 tons of propellant with only one extra ring gained in length. For version 3 or Block 3, whatever name you want to use, that increase in propellant is 800 tons relative to version 2. This is quite a lot, but it is equivalent to only four more rings on the ship's tank section. However, for version 3, the ship is getting nearly 10 rings longer relative to version 1, which means the extra six added rings out of the 10 could be for the payload bay section. So yeah, don't worry about the payload space. It's fine. Version 3, or long ship, or whatever you want to call it, is uh, going to solve the problem. Really quickly, before we leave Massey's, I do want to note that the Booster 11 debris pile is still there and looks to have been joined by Booster 12's hot stage ring, which, considering it free falled into the ocean, doesn't look bad. Although it doesn't look great. Anyway, with its cryoproof test campaign now looking complete, Ship 33 was rolled back to Mega Bay 2, where it'll be prepared to receive its engines ahead of its engine test campaign. Now, the big question will be whether it'll receive Raptor 2 engines or Raptor 3 engines. That's been one of the big debates about this upcoming version of Starship, ever since we even knew there was a new version. For future Block 2 vehicles, we do expect Raptor 3 to be used, but SpaceX could also have chosen to start off using Raptor 2 and then move to Raptor 3 once it's a more mature engine. We'll have to stay on the lookout for any engines arriving at Mega Bay 2 in the coming weeks and see whether they're Raptor 2 or Raptor 3. I know I will be keeping my eyes peeled. Speaking of keeping an eye on Mega Bay 2, during our flyover, we spotted new work platforms staged next to the building. We assume that these will eventually be installed inside Mega Bay 2 and used to service ships after they're built. SpaceX uses a very similar set of work platforms inside Mega Bay 1 for boosters, and this basically allows them to reach all of the important bits of the vehicles without having to use lifts or a shipload of scaffolding like they have to do in the high bay. You know what else is mind-boggling? AI, or what everyone is calling large language models these days. But thanks to a course from this week's sponsor, Brilliant, I now have a much better understanding of how they work. Brilliant has all kinds of amazing courses available, from foundational math all the way up to quantum computing. They recently launched a bunch of new data science content, all of which uses real data from real sources to help you see trends and make better informed decisions. Brilliant is all about hands-on learning by honing your critical thinking skills and teaching you problem solving, which is proven to be six times more effective than just, say, watching a lecture video. Plus, you don't have to be at your computer with a block of time set aside to be constantly upgrading your gray matter. You can do it right from your phone or tablet in small bites whenever you have the time. Easy! Make a habit of learning a little bit every day, and before long, you'll look back and be astonished at just how much you can fit in here. So to try everything Brilliant has for free for a full 30 days and get 20% off an annual premium subscription, visit brilliant.org slash nasaspaceflight or scan the QR code on screen or click the link in the description. 
Brilliant is such a great sponsor, so check them out. You're not only helping your channel, you're also helping yourself by keeping your brain in ship shape. Next to that staging area is the Rocket Garden, where Booster 12 was rolled to just this week. In the really rare case of you missing it, they caught the booster! It's just mind-blowing to me that Booster 12 was the very first super heavy booster to successfully fly up with a ship on top, turn around, come back to the launch site, and land on the chopsticks. And it's just sitting right there! H how is this real life? Booster 12 had been rolled to Mega Bay 1 after recovery, where we assume it was thoroughly inspected. We also had spotted since then some of the engine shields having been removed and placed inside the Star Factory, so perhaps some of the engines were removed as well, although it's impossible to know how many or which engines got removed. One thing we do know, though, is that during its time in the Mega Bay, it seems like SpaceX teams repaired the damaged Chine aero cover on Booster 12. Now, with Booster 12 at the Rocket Garden, we'll have to wait and see what the future holds for this vehicle. Hopefully, if we're lucky, SpaceX will find a nice way to display it somewhere around Starbase, just like Starhopper and Booster 1019, the first Falcon booster to land, which, of course, is on display at SpaceX in Hawthorne, California. Right near Booster 12 in the Rocket Garden is also where the Starlink payload box was moved to just a few days ago. As a reminder, this is the box that SpaceX wanted to use to load Starlink satellites onto ships. We only saw it being tested a couple of times with Ship 24, and then it stayed in the Starlink building for a bit under two years. In this flyover, we were able to spot it, and it looks like it's been dismantled and the Starlink satellites, or dummy satellites, whatever was inside, were also taken out of it. We're not really sure if this is to completely scrap the box, or if there'll just be some modifications being done to it. It's very possible that the next version of Starship will not need this kind of Starlink loader, and they'll use something different. If I were to guess, the most likely case is that it'll be scrapped, and we'll see in the future some other type of hardware to load Starlinks onto ships. Here at Sanchez is where SpaceX has also been building a bunch of the hardware for the second launch pad here in Starbase. This week we saw the arrival of the frame that will house the booster quick disconnect for pad B. This frame looks to be very similar in design to the booster quick disconnect used on pad A, and we had also seen on our last flyover the plate that will be used for this quick disconnect. So far it's looking at least like this piece of hardware for pad B will be very similar to what we see on pad A. One interesting thing to point out, though, is that despite this frame having been delivered to Sanchez, we were not able to spot it on our flyover, so it probably went into one of the tents or into the ground fabrication building. So it's very likely that the next time we see this piece of hardware, it'll be a lot more complete. What we did see on our flyover, though, was all the work going on to prepare the chopsticks, their carriage, and the ship quick disconnect arm for pad B. We can see that since our last flyover, SpaceX has put up scaffolding around the carriage system and on the chopsticks as well. We've seen that over the last couple of months, SpaceX has been upgrading both of these with reinforcements, just like we saw being installed on Pad A before Flight 5. While on our last flyover, a bunch of these reinforcements were still left to be installed, it looks like most of them have already been welded to the chopsticks. In fact, it seems as though some of them have already received the white-colored primer material, just like what we saw happen at Pad A. Then this will be painted black to keep the chopsticks all smooth and nice looking, rather than looking like some sort of weird zebra arm. We can also see a whole lot of progress on the ship quick disconnect arm for Pad B, where teams have been putting together all the parts that we've seen arriving over the last few weeks. It's worth mentioning that the part we're seeing being built here is only the shoulder and forearm of this arm, so to speak. At the end of it, there's an extension where the actual quick disconnect umbilical is located, but we have yet to see that being built. So far, it's looking like this shoulder section of the arm is a copy of the one at Pad A and the one that was built for Pad 39A in Florida. This isn't hugely surprising since it all seems to still be working just fine. It's just the final extension at the end of the arm that we probably will have to look at for any changes. Also at the Sanchez lot, can you tell there's a lot going on here lately? It is the site of the construction of the launch mount for Pad B. Unlike what we just saw with the ship quick disconnect arm, this launch mount is definitely not anything like the mount at Pad A. Instead of being circular, we can already see that it'll have a square shape, and have a circular opening inside to hold the booster. We've been seeing parts for this mount arrive for the last few weeks, and we're on the lookout for more arriving in the future. In fact, I saw one today on my way into Starbase. The way SpaceX is building this mount, it looks like it's going to have at least three layers. The bottom layer just has the square frame that we saw starting to be put together during our last flyover. Then on top of that is the layer with the level where all 20 hold-down arms will be located. In this latest flyover, only two of the corner pieces had been installed, but the other two corner pieces were staged nearby, and two middle pieces were there as well. We'll probably see SpaceX lift these other pieces to be joined together to form that middle level in the next few weeks. We're not sure how many systems will be housed here other than the hold-down arms, but we'll just have to wait and see what they do with it. 
Now, on top of this layer will probably be the top deck of the new mount, which is being built up a few meters away here at Sanchez. Mary spotted the pieces of this top deck arriving a few weeks ago, which had labels calling this the Top Deck Pancake. Mmm, now I want pancakes. This top deck looks very much like it'll be water-cooled to protect it from the fury of Raptor engines at liftoff. This is something that we do not see at Pad A, and that mount always gets cooked after every launch, and now also during the booster landing as well. Now, the whole reason we can do these flyovers, and pretty much everything that we do here at NSF, is because of the people that watch our videos just like you. So if you want to support what we do, but don't want to spend any money, just like the video and subscribe if you haven't done so. It's completely free. And that already goes a long way to helping us do what we do. Part of what we do is also look down on the new flame trench at Pad B. Since our last flyover, SpaceX has made a whole lot more progress digging out all of the ground soil where the flame trench will be located. While on the last flyover, teams had barely scratched the surface, since then, they've already dug down about 15 to 20 feet into the ground. We don't know how deep this trench will go, but if SpaceX wants to have it such that it's as deep as the height of the OLM relative to the ground at Pad A, then that means that they'll need to dig down about three or four more times what they've dug so far, if that's even possible. That this project will require some time to be completed shouldn't be a surprise given just how huge everything is here at Starbase. While SpaceX continues to dig the flame trench, it looks like they're now pouring concrete for the commodities trench where we expect there'll be all of the cryogenic pipes and water lines for the launch mount. With concrete now going in, this is a sign that perhaps by the next flyover, this commodities trench will be ready to start getting some of that plumbing. Speaking of which, this week we also saw new cryogenic pipes being delivered to Starbase and sent to the launch site. But these are not just some little, tiny, small pipes or anything. These are big pipes. In fact, they have labels indicating that some are 20 inches wide and others are a full 24 inches wide, which would approximately be 50 and 60 centimeters, respectively. We're not sure where these will be going, but given their size and also their squiggly shape, it kind of reminds me of the pipes that are used for the sub coolers. Remember, the SpaceX has already said that Pad B will share the same storage tanks used for Pad A, but this doesn't mean that there can't be a new set of pumps and sub coolers dedicated for Pad B alone. If you saw a couple of Starbase update episodes ago, SpaceX sent two new sub coolers to the launch site. Well, just this last week, they lifted one of them into place. We can see them both here, sitting already near the LOX tanks at the tank farm. While the storage tanks will be the same, having separate pumps and subcoolers for both pads makes sense from an operations perspective. A third subcooler is still sitting at Sanchez, which we could see during this flyover. And that one should be headed down here to the launch site soon as well. We've also been seeing a lot more progress preparing all of the places where we expect other systems to be installed for Pad B. There's this big square where we think the cryogenics bunker for Pad B will be located. There's still tons of rebar laying nearby as well and groundwork has seemingly started on a rectangular patch of land right across from the main entrance. How this will all look is still very much up in the air, no pun intended. But there's no doubt that it's already looking a whole lot different than just a year ago when Starship Flight 2 was about to happen. While all of this is going on, it looks like teams are dismantling the giant CC-8800-1 crane that had been used to stack the second launch tower. We had thought that perhaps it would stick around for a few more months and aid in installing the chopsticks and QD arm for Tower 2, but it looks like that won't be the case. This means that either the SpaceX LR-1100 crane will help on this, or SpaceX will bring in a new crane to do this work. We'll just have to wait and see. Of course, the construction work at Starbase is not just taking place at the launch site. If you've been following along, SpaceX has built a massive 1 million square foot factory to build Starship and Super Heavy vehicles. They're also building a new massive office building, which will likely be the new managerial center of Starbase. These two buildings are also being connected by a passageway, and it looks like some other adjacent constructions are being put in place as well. As of this flyover, the roof of the passageway is now being installed. It also looks like the office building is receiving another multi-leveled extension on the back side of it relative to the road. It wouldn't be surprising if SpaceX built a nice outdoor area here for employees to relax and maybe drink their morning coffee before going into the office and getting to work on sending starships to Mars. Before any of that happens though, they have to work on getting more vehicles built, and that's what's been happening this week inside Mega Bay 1. Just a few days ago, we saw SpaceX roll the third barrel section for the liquid oxygen tank of Booster 16 from the Star Factory and into Mega Bay 1. We know it's this barrel, not just because it's the third that we've seen for this booster, but also because it's the one that has the top of the vehicle's chines. 
during construction, SpaceX installs small little cranes in this section that help them be able to lift all of the COPVs and the CO2 tanks that are housed under the Chine aero covers. So that's a very clear giveaway. In fact, this week we saw SpaceX roll into Mega Big One, one of the big cylindrical tanks that's used to hold carbon dioxide for the booster's fire suppression system. These tanks go inside the Chine, so it's all coming up millhouse here. Since boosters 13 and 14 have already gotten those installed, and 16 is nowhere near close to receiving them, we assume that this tank was most likely for booster 15. If SpaceX doesn't skip any boosters and doesn't reuse them either, then this will be the booster used for Flight 8, which will likely be carrying Starship 34 on top. Of course, while all of this work on future flights is ongoing, SpaceX keeps preparing for the next flight. Flight 6 will feature Booster 13 and Ship 31, and while we can't see Booster 13 inside Mega Bay 1, we can see the progress on Ship 31 as it sits inside the high bay. During the last few weeks, we've been seeing teams work on its heat shield as they prepare it for its own re-entry on Flight 6. One thing we've observed lately is that it seems like they've removed all the tiles on the side of the vehicle and left only the ones on the belly. We're not sure if this is how Ship 31 will fly, but perhaps it's good to remember something that SpaceX tested during Starship Flight 5. Roll the clip. For this flight, SpaceX also performed more materials testing and experiments on Ship 30. The company confirmed that they had installed tiles covered in aluminum in certain places on the side of the vehicle. These would allow SpaceX to understand how hot it gets in those places as aluminum melts at the temperature that stainless steel starts to become weak. While SpaceX didn't say why they were doing this, it wouldn't be surprising if the aim was to remove some patches of tiles from the side of the vehicle to later introduce hardware to catch ships. So given that testing with aluminum on Flight 5, it could be that SpaceX saw there's no need for heat shield tiles to be that close to the leeward side, and they can remove them. Since this is the last flight of a version 1 ship, it wouldn't be all that surprising if SpaceX decided that instead of just having little test sections with test materials on them, the entire vehicle just becomes the test material itself. Think about it. If they can get rid of all the tiles on the sides of the ships, they could lower their mass and potentially be able to install hardware to catch them in the future. This would also make construction, inspection, and repair of a ship's heat shield a lot easier. Whatever SpaceX does with Ship 31, you better believe we'll be keeping our eyes on it. As the vehicles continue to be prepared for flight, the launch site is also getting ready for it as well. Ever since Booster 13 was tested on the orbital launch mount a couple of weeks ago, we've seen a lot of work going on pretty much everywhere. We've seen workers inside the booster quick disconnect, which, while it was able to support Booster 13's static fire, perhaps SpaceX wanted to get more reinforcements, inspections, and whatnot done on it ahead of another flight. Work is also still going on inside the launch mount deck and on the orbital launch mount itself. For our flyover, we can see that teams had installed the alignment rig that is used to calibrate the precise location and extension of the hold-down arms. This process can sometimes take quite a few days, and it's kind of surprising it's still needed after five flights, but, well, here we are. Teams have also been working on the chopsticks as well, and testing them once again. Some of these tests are very similar to what we've seen in the past. Raise the arms to catch height, and then perform a different closing test of some kind. We can only hope that all of this work is to improve all of the stuff that already worked on Flight 5 and make it even more better on Flight 6. If SpaceX truly wants the next launch of Starship to happen soon, we might be starting to see some promising signs of this in the coming days and weeks. This could be in the form of rollout closures for Ship 31 and Booster 13. We also may be so close that we could even start to see notices going out for the launch in the coming weeks. We frankly don't know right now, but we'll be on the alert for any of these things to happen and we'll be reporting on it and streaming as usual. Do you think we might be seeing some of the hints that Flight 6 is happening soon, or do you think we'll have to wait until we're farther in November? Let us know in the comments. Oh my god, it's November. All right, that's gonna be it for this week. See you in the next one, and until then, don't forget, be excellent to each other.